Hey. Jeremy. How's it going, Rod? Hey, man. How are you? I'm good. Good. It's good to see you again. You too. Thank you for yeah. taking the time to chat. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. Thanks for having me. Um, I, how's your day? Uh, you know what? It's, so it's 11 a.m. So it's kind of... <laughs> Time, time time for it to go down you know <laughs> still time left <laughs> how about yours great great it's been relaxing i was in uh new york last week so i uh been spending yesterday and today kind of just taking it easy right was yeah. new york work related yeah so um my my girlfriend played um seth meyer she plays with ash and so we went and like saw that and then the harry release came out so we all like went to the show and yeah. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It was really nice. What was the and massive congratulations on the Harry album as well. But Thanks. what how, how did it feel to for that to be birthed out into the world? For it finally to be out? Oh, it was good. It was good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I felt pretty good about it the whole time. <laughs> like like since day one I was like, This record's gonna be amazing. I just had a feeling. But yeah, it's really cool seeing it go out and like it was cool, like um just uh you know, the crowd like knew a lot of the songs to like, or a lot of, knew a lot of the words to the songs that had like just come out that day. So I think that's like kind of like powerful to watch. And like, you know, Harry's just such a powerful guy. It was just like really cool to like see people kind of like, um, I don't know, they just really like dedicate themselves to him and like give a lot back to him as an audience. It's awesome. Yeah, the entire stadium, like, cause as it was, it's been out for a minute, like the entire, stadium it was like 17,000 plus was singing it it was like that was an awe <laughs> it, was, it was really wild yeah really fun when when you see that um can you separate or, or how do you process it knowing that you've been there from almost the beginning in terms of the actual you've seen these songs being recorded you've played a part of them being recorded yeah. and now they're out there in the world and people are reacting that must give you a really a different perspective on on what you're seeing there as opposed to someone just listening to the music as a fan yeah yeah i mean it's a part of like any creative process after a while you just have to you give it away it's kind of how i think of it like it's a uh, i don't know it's no longer just yours it belongs to everyone once you like put it on the internet and give it to fans so i don't know i, I find it like really um rewarding that's like my, my favorite part is releasing music um, yeah. and just yeah giving it away you know i think that's fun can you can you listen to it without thinking ah oh, this part was this part was really hard this part was a challenge or oh, i remember when we recorded <laughs> just no of... more more like fond memories no i don't really there wasn't like honest i didn't feel i mean like tom and tyler and harry might say different things but like the making of that album didn't feel like really challenging to me like it was just really enjoyable the whole time even when it was like i mean there's definitely times like like in our first trip to shangri-la i was like working like 10 a.m to like 5 6 a.m like every single day pretty much um but even then it didn't feel challenging i was just like grateful and like really happy to be doing it so um yeah only fond memories no <laughs> i don't really remember challenges of it yeah <laughs> How do you, I mean, how many days in a row would you do those hours? Pretty consistently. <laughs> yeah, pretty consistently. Yeah. All depends, you know. I mean, the first, like, what happens anytime you go in right off the bat, I think, like, and we, we had this a lot over COVID, we ended up doing like a lot of like um, residential sessions. And so um, with a bunch of different artists, Harry was one of them. Uh, but like a lot of times, like there's that first like nine days to like, 14 days where everyone's just like kind of like stimulated and like oh we're here we're gonna make like this we have we have to crush it while we're here you know what i mean so like everyone kind of goes extra extra hard um so a lot of times like the first two weeks are definitely pretty um hour extensive but honestly like the way i mean i work when i go in the situations pretty consistently throughout i just like kind of choose to go hard because i want everything to like sound really good and i want the artist to feel really really good and you know it's like you're there to like shine a light on them and the people making the music as much as possible. So it's kind of, yeah. yeah. I remember when As It Was came out, you did an Instagram post and mm -hmm. I think you were saying that you, you built a full studio in a living room in the UK. Yeah, we did. What, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what was the process of doing that? Uh, I've done that a few times, actually. We, we did it for like the Shawn Mendes record too. And um, anyways, yeah. So, I mean, that process is like we had, uh, a house it was a friend of Harry's and so I literally just um in that case 
you know, anytime you go into a studio session, there's always like some sort of rental situation, but like we just hit up John Henry and, and had a massive, massive rental list and literally, you know, cargoed out a full studio's worth of gear and like set it up in what was like a family TV room. And like, but I like, I, you know, like I said, I go hard. So I like, I had everything like it snakes and the whole bit, like giant racks of gear. And like, there was a little library off the side that I ran drums into and like, you have to be careful of like, I actually shorted the power in the house once when I was like plugging it in. So like eventually we had to get like, you know, like 300 feet cable to like run to like different sectors of the house. So like the power was running off of like different, um, basically like fuses. Um, so yeah, but it's awesome. Like you can kind of like, I don't know. I like, uh, I love going into big studios, but like my favorite way to record is just kind of like just being in a room together. So that, that can happen anywhere you know like a lot of times even like when we went to shangri-la the first time we um we didn't use a control room we literally just like fed everything out to the live room and made that our control room and like um that's the best way to make music is just everyone in the room there's like as little separation as possible and yeah yeah when did you become um comfortable doing that like when did when did you become um adept at actually being able to to do that sort of setup and to be confident that the yep we can do this I can do this was there a point in your career where where you had that confidence and you had that know how? Um, I think just, honestly, I just think kind of accumulated over time. You know, I uh, I'd say I look when I started out, I was like a really really good software guy. Like I'm really fast and good in Pro Tools and all that. But um, I was actually an employee at Shangri La for like a year and a half, a couple of years. And like there you have to learn a lot about troubleshooting and like, you know, fixing things in high intensity, high intensity environments, like fixing them so fast that kind of like no one notices that it was even, you know, broken. So like there you kind of like, I learned a lot about um, like a studio construction for lack of a better word. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there wasn't a moment. It's just kind of like a long yeah. string of uh, experiences that kind of like, you know, led yeah. to where, where I am. And that, that's Shangri-La, that's Rick Rubin, Shangri-La. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So yeah. In what, how did you come to be there? And, and it sounds like it was a pretty steep learning experience, having to work so quickly and to, and to make mistakes go away or, or problems go away without anyone even noticing. Yeah. What, yeah. what was that like working at, at Shangri-La and how did you come to be there? It was great. Um, I honestly, like, I was kind of a, I was almost like out of the music industry, to be honest. I was living in Nashville at the time and like had gotten like a normal job and all that. And then um, my girlfriend was living in Los Angeles. So, and we decided I was going to come back and I just, you know, I had a rule for myself that I was just going to, I had needed a job before I came back. So I like reached out to some friends of mine and um, my friend Sean was actually Rick's um, first like assistant engineer when Shangri-La first opened. So he put me in touch with, um, Eric, the studio manager there, and just kind of went from there. Yeah. And it was a really great learning experience. Like I really, it's still to this day, it's my favorite studio, hands down. Right. Yeah. yeah, I love it there. What, um, why were you out of the industry? Why were you, why had you decided that perhaps the industry was, you'd, you'd had enough or you wanted to move into something else? Oh, it's just, it was, I didn't say, I, I hadn't had enough. It was just like kind of normal up and downs. Like I was a touring musician and stuff for a while and just, did a bunch of stuff and I don't know just kind of a yeah just found my way back in by working at Shangri-La and then doing that whole process so. yeah fair enough mm -hmm. there's a there's a question there from Michelle Font and I'm missing some questions as they go through I apologize but she's asked okay. um, how was working with Harry he's the best yeah he's the best yeah I love Harry he's a just a very um very respectful very kind person and an extraordinary artist and he has um yeah just a lot of a lot of vision so it's great working with him it's really enjoyable when you when you're working on an album like his latest one and there's obviously a lot of expectation mm -hmm. and presumably a lot of pressure how do you see people dealing with that and and shutting that out of the studio so that that doesn't become um that doesn't impact the music in any way do you see you must see artists having to deal with that and and how they go about dealing with it yeah I, I think everyone's everyone's different honestly so it's like there's not like a straight answer for that i think everyone deals with that kind of in their own way um 
I think the thing I saw Harry do that I thought was really smart um, was when we were like kind of at the end of that record, he just started like having kind of like um, private listening parties that he would, he would bring like people he trusted in like friends and, and, and all that to like, and just sit and listen to like the whole record, you know, kind of where we were with it before he like did the sit down with like his, his representatives and all that. And I think, you know, I think doing something like that can be really empowering just like being allowing yourself to get a second opinion you know so mm -hmm. um for me i just don't i just i don't know i just kind of like focus on all the task at hand so it's easy for me to not get stressed out by any of it <laughs> to be honest <laughs> i did none of it really stresses me out i'm just like i know how to make this sound good i'm just gonna like do the thing <laughs> right, right yeah yeah you mentioned earlier that you're a touring musician um and mm -hmm. i know you still you still performing and still touring and you know playing with Andrew McMahon for example who was on your couch the last time that we spoke yeah yeah, Andrew oh, right. yeah I don't I don't tour anymore I just do production and stuff now it's like um but yeah I used to tour with Andrew and play guitar with him and all that and right. it was a fun experience I loved it I just uh I'm definitely like a studio guy yeah as a, as a good older I like I like waking up in my own house every day and yeah. being able to exercise and all that <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. But was that your entry point into the industry as a musician? Was that your initial mm -hmm. like, first goal? That was my first goal, yeah. So like, I went to college um, for music. Like, you know, my, my instrument was guitar. And uh, I played in loads of bands. Like, there was a point in L.A. where I was playing, like, five shows a night. I was just playing with, like, anyone that I could. You know, just any band, any artist, anything, just doing everything. Um, but then I kind of just realized that I personally wanted to feel like a little more empowered as far as like my value to other people and um you know just music I wanted to have a little more control over like the process of music making so I went back to learn how to engineer and then when I was in like at the end of my my engineer uh, courses I got offered an internship with um John Feldman and so like that's how I started um you know entry point with really with like um, music production stuff and then I actually ended up touring with Andrew like years down the road and then, you know, anyways, ultimately ended up at Shangri-La and then, yeah, here we are. <laughs> and, and John, John Felvin must, that must have been an, a really incredible time because I think, uh, and you can see on your resume, you have some credits with Black Veil Brides, for example, and I think there's some work with the used as well. So this, mm -hmm. John was very um, prolific in working with mm -hmm. a lot of bands. Yeah. What, what, uh, was, was that a steep learning curve for you actually interning with John and seeing these bands come in and, and what's involved with actually totally. yeah, yeah I, well, didn't, I didn't I didn't know anything yet <laughs> at the time I was like I was really really green and like like a week or so after you know in, into like working with him he's like can you edit and I was like sure <laughs> and I just like uh, there was another engineer named uh, Brandon Paddock there who kind of like honestly like taught me he's the best engineer I've ever seen in my life he's just like a freak of nature and so he taught me everything and like taught me how to use uh pro tools like an instrument and just uh yeah that kind of that's, that's where i started basically you know okay um yeah. what, what about some of the non-technical stuff you learned because there, there's also a world in the studio that um i guess revolves around relationships with the mm -hmm. artists and how to act in the studio were, yeah. were there some key learnings there that you got when you were interning with john no I learned, honestly, I got more of that from like Shangri-La and like working with Kid Harpoon, you know, cause like those places though, like, you know, it's uh, like Shangri-La, especially it's only like the, the top people in the industry in the world that go through there really. And so um, you just have to be really mindful all the time that like these people are there to like have, you know, like this really creative experience and you need to be really sensitive to that and just uh, kind of aware all the time like mm. you can't ever slip or anything like that and um yeah i learned a lot there especially like working you know um yeah i think the, those standards that like rick wants when he's around and like the types of art even where, when rick's not around we still would follow that type of protocol at shangri-la like everything just needs to be as flawless as it possibly can and um I heard recently, like, Fariel, she's the uh, studio manager for Henson, and she tells all her employees, like, when people come in here, your job is to make their dreams come true all the time. 
And like, I think that's like the best advice for it. It's like a hundred percent true. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. Honestly, even if you're like, if you're in a small studio, big studio, like that should be your goal the whole time. Like, and it's like the producer's job too. Honestly, like producers are like the best producers in the world. They're trying to do that for artists. And it's a bit of a service position, you know, you gotta be really conscious of it. And yeah. That's really great advice. I've never heard mm -hmm. it put like that. that you're you're there to make people's dreams come true. That's such 100%. a great way. Of... Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that that uh, you started like guitar was your instrument when you were starting out. Mm -hmm. What what even what even took you to the guitar? What even put the guitar on your radar? I was I was a kid. <laughs> I was, yeah, sure. I was little, it was it was Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain was like my first, uh, you know, the first musician that I glommed onto, and then you know, listen to Beatles and Radiohead. And, all that so it kind of spawned from there for sure i would like i spent like most of my childhood like playing guitar in my room like by myself <laughs> pretty much yeah yeah well, it's the best way to learn you just gotta like learn a bunch of songs you love and like i didn't learn like you know when i got to college and all that i had to like learn music in a different way but you know growing up that was like my educational process was just finding music that i loved and trying to replicate it Right. And mm. what did the, you're spending your days in your bedroom playing guitar, what did the guitar represent to you? Did you see it instantly that, ah, oh, this is for me, this is where I want to go in my life? Yeah, immediately. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, guess, I, don't know, I, I don't know if it represented it. I just knew that was a, I felt connected to it. Yeah. That's, okay. And I, you know, the town, I grew up in like a pretty small town, like, you know, before the internet, you know, so like, I remember going to like record stores when I was a little kid and um, you know, the radio was still like a big thing and oh, it just, it just felt like exciting and like something bigger than where I was like yeah. music and, and, you know, playing an instrument and all that. So yeah, yeah it, was, it was just an immediate connection. I can't really explain it. I guess I just like felt drawn to it like oh. immediately. Yeah. Where, where was that small town? Did you say? I grew up in Howell, Michigan. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. what point did you move to LA? When I was 20. Yeah. Like the day after my 20th birthday, actually, I drove out here. <laughs> to play in bands to, to make it as a musician. Pretty much. Yeah. Or to attempt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's it like? What's it like rolling into a town like LA did, to, to do that? Did you have contacts there? Were you just on your own? Oh, no, like no, <laughs> no. I mean, I went to college. I think when you go to like a, um, I don't know. Anytime you go somewhere new, especially as a young person, I think it like you either need to like go there for a purpose, like a job or college or have like a group of friends. Otherwise it's gonna, you know, it's hard for most people to kind of like assimilate and like find their place. I think like, because I went to college when I first moved out here, it was a little easier, mm -hmm. you know, cause I like, you know, immediately like developed a friend group and I like had something to focus on every day. And you know, it was a pretty, pretty positive experience for me. Like, right off the bat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of the, just going back to some of your recent credits, we, we mm -hmm. talked about styles, but also mm -hmm. Florence Jean, um, mm -hmm. is yeah. you've been involved with recently. Yeah. And again, another Instagram post. Um, I think you said that Florence is one of the best artists in the world. Mm -hmm. What, what, why do you think that? What, what did you see of working with her that, that gave you that, that uh, impression and opinion? Um, she's just she's got a really good vibe about her her whole energy is just kind of inspiring and she's probably one of my favorite lyricists that i've ever heard and um i don't know she's always like she always calls herself like a like an indie kid from <laughs> from london you know so like she, i like that she wasn't like uh i don't know she wasn't trying to like make music that anyone else wanted to hear she just wanted to make music that made her feel things and mm -hmm. Yeah, she's just a really cool, cool person and like truly an unbelievable singer. She's very, very good. <laughs> and so, yeah. What is it like being in the studio when someone like Florence is in the vocal booth or wherever she is in the studio doing her vocals? Do you get a chance just to witness it or are you just focused on the work? Oh, yeah, both. Yeah, yeah. both, honestly. Yeah, it's just, it's inspiring. Yeah, I just, mm. yeah, it's great. <laughs> Um, and last uh, recent credit I want to ask you about is Maggie Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, I know, obviously, we've heard um, the first single, That's Where I Am, but I know you've mm -hmm. been involved with the record with uh, engineering and vocal programming. 
Um, how would you describe those sessions? They're great. Yeah, cool. Maggie's awesome. Yeah, we did. Uh, Tom and I did the whole the whole record. Um, we did a lot of it at at Real World, and then um, they did. We did a session in Electric Lady, and yeah, um, it's great. Maggie's Maggie's powerful. She's a powerful artist, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the record's really good. I think it, you know I'm really excited for it to come out. And, nice. So yeah. with, with probably a really uh, stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. When you are when you are engineering with Maggie Rogers, for example, mm -hmm. what is, what is your day to day role? What what do you are you just you're there to make sure that everything works? Like how how is your what are you doing on a daily basis? I think I think my role is the same no matter what. Honestly, I'm just trying to make the sound, song sound as good as possible. And so, um, yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to like sum up really. Like pretty much when we go to studios, like you know, especially when I'll go with Tom and I, like we completely max the room out as far as like inputs and recording capability. Like I always tell studios ahead of time, like we're going to completely max out your room. You're probably going to have to like buy new things and like it's, it's going to be like a whole thing. It's going to take us like a few days to get it ready. Um, and then from there, once like we all arrive, like I don't know, the main goal is to just make the song as good as possible. So it doesn't matter like what part the song is at as far as like writing or production goes, like the whole goal is just make it as good as possible. So um, yeah, there's like, there's so many steps involved in that. It's hard, it's hard to sum up, but. That's fine. That's, that's fine. Yeah. But, so when you, when you were, um, I guess, working at Shangri-La or, or working with John Feldman, uh, or even before that, and you have an idea about what working in the studio is going to be like and what working at this level is going to be like, mm -hmm. how close was, the, I guess, the dream or the imagination to the actual reality? Um, I th well, I think most people's, like, expectations are a little exaggerated just because you don't have anything to base it off of. So everything, like, seems, like, very, yeah, just inflated. But honestly, uh, I don't know, the reality has been awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean and like I said it's been like it was like kind of a gradual thing for me you know so it's like it's not like I like just woke up and was like working on Harry Styles records like it, it took a long time you know a lot of like um career experience and a lot of just like personal experience outside of music that kind of like led me to that place so I think by the time like I was finally like invited into spaces like that I was actually like emotionally and like you know, had the technical expertise, you know, I was just kind of like prepared and ready for all that stuff. And so mm -hmm. I don't know, it finally happened. It was just, um, yeah, I guess I didn't really think too much about it. It was, it was just like easy at that point. Where I was like, oh, this is great. This is where I want to be. I'm like ready to do this, <laughs> you know? So, it also Jerry, wasn't like when that, when the big stuff started happening too, it was also like 33, you know, it was like different. I think if I was like younger in my, in my early twenties of, you know, might've been like quietly sweating. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> but by the time it happened i was just like yeah i think i'm ready for this this is cool <laughs> that's awesome yeah. jeremy there are, there are a couple of questions which people have put in the um i guess question box which if you don't mind i might might start running through a couple of them yeah yeah go ahead yeah. uh one is from uh sensible ben who says thank you for your time jeremy which credit are you most proud of in your career uh the harry record that whole record yeah that's yeah I'm really grateful to be a part of that. I think, I think people like him don't come around very often. So I feel very lucky that I got to do that. Nice one. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, David Palut um, has asked, tell the chief or has, has said, tell the chief Keith story, recording him while he is on house arrest. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> There's another question from uh, Armana and, um, saying, hello, thanks for the interview. Um, how can I collaborate with Jeremy with my band? Um, I guess you can try and send me something on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. start start there. Yeah. So with with um, some of the producing work, well, I guess with all of your studio work, your background is, as a musician has mm -hmm. that given you uh, an empathy or an insight into the needs of artists that perhaps you may not have had were you not for were you not a musician yourself do you think that that's a, a key part of being a studio professional probably yeah you know i think everyone in that environment's sensitive in a day like um yeah i think so <laughs> definitely all right yeah i mean people outside of music are sensitive too i think just part of like being 
on earth and doing anything is trying to be conscious of other people and them having an experience. So just, you know, just pay attention, be aware of everyone. Yeah, nice one. And so just to, to finish up, what, what's exciting you about engineering or producing or, or your, your programming work? Is there a mm. new technological development? Is there, is there something in the, the pipeline that's really got you excited about where things are going next? Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a whole, like, it's, a, it's always, it's my favorite thing to do, honestly. Like, it drives my girlfriend nuts because I don't really like, I don't really take days off or anything like that. And even like on my days off, I'm kind of constantly just teaching myself new stuff like all the time constantly learning so um i think the most exciting thing always ends up being just whatever you're working on at the moment you know um it's so like right now I'm, I'm producing intro man's neck record so like that's really exciting to me right now you know what i mean um and so when you know when i'm ever in the zone like everything i'm kind of doing is like catered to making that thing the best it can be <laughs> and so yeah but Bye. Yeah, it's always exciting. It's like, that's a crazy exciting field. And the technology involved now is incredible. Like, I'm really glad I'm not a producer in the 70s because I don't, you know, my brain, the way my brain works is like, it's really active. And so I think like being able to like jump into a computer and literally have a symphony at your fingertips, like just kind of caters to how I think in general. Nice, so. nice one. Mm -hmm. Jerry, thanks so much for your time. It's been yeah. really taking the time to chat it's been great yeah yeah thanks for having me Rod. i appreciate it yeah my pleasure yeah. well you enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening mm -hmm. um and uh look forward to hearing this uh, andrew mcmahon album when um when the time comes yeah thanks man take care all right talk to you later bye bye